Hey, my name is Dave Wells. I'm part of the pastoral staff here. Those of you watching online this morning, a good morning to you, online church. And for those of you who are here, a good morning to you as well. And we trust that, uh, I think we had a great time in our worship service this morning. Do you sense the presence of Jesus? Amen. How many believe that Jesus is here? He's here. Amen. In fact, he came with you. You brought him. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And so let's pray together. Father, we want to exalt you and praise you today. And uh, we pray as we look to your word this morning that you would just stir something in us. Lord, we need a greater understanding and a revelation, not only of who you are, but who we are. And so, Lord, I just pray this morning that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you speak to our minds and our hearts today, Lord. It's not, so, it's not important what I say, Lord. It's really important what you say. And we pray, Father, that you would just help us to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, at the beginning, uh, we're, we're doing, we've been doing a series on the book of Acts. We started off um, 2000, 2, 2.22 uh, with, a, with a, an emphasis on prayer in the month of January and in the first part of February. And then we've been doing a, a series on the book of Acts, and I think this could be the last one uh, on this series. And uh, really, it's a, it's a series about the Holy Spirit. And it's a series about, it, about what happens when the Holy Spirit fills people and moves upon a group of people called the church, called the body of Christ. And uh, so we've been focusing our messages on the book of Acts because when we read about that first century church, we see a dynamic there. We see a life. We see a power that makes our mouth water. And we ask ourselves the question, Lord, we want that. We want to experience the kind of life, the kind of power, the kind of anointing, the kind of fruitfulness that we actually saw described for us in the book of Acts. And I want to tell you, church, nothing's changed. God hasn't changed. The body of Christ hasn't changed. That we actually have an opportunity to move in the Holy Spirit on a level uh, that, that we have not yet got, gotten to. I, I believe that. I believe that there, how many believe this morning that, you know, we could flow in a greater degree of the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? That we could have, actually have a greater fruitfulness, a greater effectiveness. You know, and I was, as I was just kind of looking at the book, the book of Acts, I kind of stood back and just kind of looked, looked at it. And I want to do a couple of snapshots here this morning. In, uh, you know, of course we know the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and it was, the church, it, it started with an incredible bang. And uh, 3,000 people got saved. And then, uh, not that long afterwards, Peter and John were going to the temple one day and there was a lame man who had been sitting at that gate for 40 years and had, was paralyzed and had never walked. And uh, one day, Peter and John passing by stopped and Peter said to him, you know, I don't have any money, but I have something for you today. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he grabbed him by his hand, he pulled him to his feet and he started leaping and jumping and worshiping God. And for the first time in his life, he was able to actually accompany Peter and John into the temple. And of course, everybody knew this guy, and everybody flocked around Peter and, and were basically adulating him and saying, Peter, I mean, wow, look at you, you're an amazing guy. And, and, uh, and they were praising Peter, and Peter stopped them, said, hey, it wasn't me. Uh, and, and as a result of that incredible miracle, 5,000 more people uh, ran to the church. And, you know, the religious authorities of that time weren't too excited to see that. And so they arrested uh, Peter and John, and uh, they threw them in jail, and then they pulled them out, and they threatened them, and, uh, and said, stop preaching in that name. And it says in Acts 4, verse 13, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, they were not intimidated at all, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. You know, what, what makes these guys tick? How could they move in such authority? Such, how could they be so confident? How could they be so bold? Hey, you know what? I think they've been with Jesus. And then it says, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. They were speechless. What are, what are we going to do with this? You know, you go on a little bit further. And... Uh, and of course, uh, the church has grown and expanded. And in fact, the church of Jerusalem was, came under our persecution and the, the saints 
uh, were scattered and, and they started going everywhere preaching the gospel. And some of them came to a place called Antioch. And, uh, and all of a sudden, something happened at Antioch that was unusual. We had, we had Jews and we had Gentiles getting saved and being in the same body of believers. In fact, when you study that Antioch church, it was an amazing church. It was a multi, multi-ethnic multi church. They had people from all the then known world. Uh, they had, it was, uh, it was a, uh, there was a, a, a real diversity among the, the economic status of the people. You had rich people in that church. You had poor people in that church. You had people at every different level that you can imagine. And that church was an amazing church, a powerful church. And it says in Acts chapter 11, in verse 25, uh, Barnabas went there and started preaching and teaching. And then it got to be growing so strong. He said, I need help. And he went to a place called Tarsus and found a guy named Saul, who later became Paul. And he said he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people. And disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Notice here, church, they didn't call themselves Christians. The people in the city started calling them Christians. Well, what, did they, what does that mean? What does the word Christian actually mean? It means this. It means Christ man or Christ slaves. When they looked at the church, the, the non-believers, the non-Christians, they, those are the Christians. Those are the slaves of Christ. Those are the people that belong to Jesus. They are Christ men. They are Christ women. That's what it means to be called a Christian. So there was something powerful and dynamic that was going on in that local church. And then a little bit further on, Paul on his second missionary journey uh, came to a city called Thessalonica and started preaching the gospel there. And a riot broke out. And people began to cry out with these words. And it says in Acts 17, verse 6, when they did not, they they were looking for Paul and Silas. They They wanted to kill him. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have, who have upset the world have come here also. And Jesus has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, there is another king, Jesus. These men who've upset the whole world have come here too. That was the impact of the body of Christ in that region of the world in the first century. So why? Why was this church so powerful? Why was this so dynamic? And I want to just talk about a couple of things this morning. In fact, I just want to talk about one thing. Well, the first reason, obviously, is they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But let's talk about the second reason. The second reason is they were conscious of being a part of the body of Christ. They had a body consciousness. You know, you're sitting here this morning and you're conscious of your physical body. Your fingers move, you can feel your body, your feet. You're very conscious of your body. You're you're aware of every ache and pain and feeling and emotion. You're body conscious. But and that's fantastic. But I want to say to you that one of the areas in which we lack is that we're not we're not body conscious in terms of who we are as a body of believers. We are not conscious. Not as conscious as we should be. I'm not saying we're not conscious. I'm saying that our degree of consciousness is not strong enough. That we are not, we don't think right. That we need a paradigm shift in our thinking. You know, let me give you some examples of body consciousness in the first century church. I'm just going to quote a few scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, it says, And all these were continually devoting themselves with one mind to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his, his brothers. In Acts chapter 2, it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, just like we are here this morning. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. What is that? 
a body consciousness, a, a sense of the presence of Jesus. And many wonders and signs were taking place to the apostles, and all the believers were together and had all things in common, and they would sell their property and possessions and share them <coughs> with all to the extent that anyone had a need, and day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. There's the description of a church that has a body consciousness about them. When Peter and John were released from jail and were threatened to stop preaching in that name, they, in Acts chapter 4, they gathered together in a prayer meeting. And then they began to pray. And in Acts chapter 4 records their prayer. And it says, and when they heard this, they raised their voices to God with one mind and said, Lord, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant it to your bondservants to speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own but all things were common property to them, and with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. Now, that's the church that has a body consciousness, and you see the authority, and you see the, the anointing, and the power that was begin that was manifested through that body of believers. <clears throat> you see, one of our difficulties as Christians in this modern day, in this modern world, is we do not discern the body of Christ very well. And in, because the discernment is a matter of inward consciousness. And so if we wish to live the life of the body of Christ, we must first receive the revelation of the body of Christ. Now, Paul was a man who wrote more about the body of Christ than any other person in the New Testament, any other person in the Bible. Paul got it. Paul understood it. You say, well, when did Paul get the revelation that we people are actually the body of Jesus Christ? Where did he get that? He got it the moment he got saved. His eyes were, had begun to be opened right on the day, uh, on the day that he, was, he met Jesus on the Damascus route. In fact, let's read it. Paul is, of course, we know what he's doing. He's called Saul then, and he's persecutor of the church, and he's killing Christians, and he's trying to stamp out this uh, religious sect. That's what he thought of it. And this aberration that somehow, to Judaism, that was wrong. And he wanted to stamp it out. And it says in, in Acts chapter 9, verse 3, Now as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I think Saul got two shocks that day. First of all, he saw Jesus. And, it, and, the, and the light was so bright, it blinded him. And so he got a revelation that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. That was one revelation. The second revelation he got was of the body of Christ. Because Jesus said to him, hey, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I think, the, I think at that point, there was an aha moment in Paul's mind. I think in a, a sick feeling like all these Christians that I've been killing and throwing into prison and selling into slavery and hurting and whipping and persecuting. I'm actually, every one of those people, gee, I've been persecuting Jesus. I've been persecuting the Messiah. When I cause them pain, I cause Jesus pain. And I think that was a total shock to understand, a total revelation that if you touch the member, you also touch the head. Listen, church, is it still true today? Whatever we do to a fellow believer, either good or bad, we do to the head. 
We hurt, we hurt a member of the body of Christ, we hurt the head. We sin against a member of the body of Christ, we sin against the head. We encourage a, a member of the body of Christ, we encourage the head. Whatever you do to a fellow believer, you've done it to Jesus. That's body consciousness. But do we think about that very often? You see, if you hurt my hand, my head feels the pain. <laughs> right? You hurt my foot, my head feels the pain. Whatever you do to my body, my head feels the pain. And it's the same thing is true of the body of Christ. Church, this morning, as we're here this morning, we're not just a group of people that just happen to gather on a Sunday morning and are sitting in some chairs listening to some guy speak. That's not what we're here. Do, we need to understand something. A portion of the body of Christ is assembled right here, right in this room. Say, can we, I wish we could see Jesus. You can. Look around. Say, well, I sense Jesus. That's great. But you can see him. He's sitting right beside you. He's sitting right in front of you. He's sitting right behind you. This isn't just a gathering like you'd have a gathering of a service club, like the Rotary or the Alex. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. They're service clubs. But this is not that. This is not just a meeting. This is an assembling of the body of Christ here this morning. And there's something awesome about that. And the more I understand that, the, bigger, the greater the revelation, the greater the sense of body consciousness. And the greater the sense of body consciousness, can I tell you something? The more the life of the body begins to be manifest. And we start seeing things, amazing things happen. The second thing is that not only what we do to the, a member touches the head, but we are dependent on the members of the body to help us, to assist us, to minister to us, and also to receive from us. It's interesting that what, what Jesus said next to Paul. He said, get up and go into the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. Well, hold on, Jesus, why don't you just tell him right now? Hey, Jesus, why don't you just tell Saul right there in Damascus Road? No, he was led into the city and he was praying for three days and he had a vision of a guy named Ananias uh, coming to see him. And Ananias, uh, and Ananias didn't really, wasn't too excited about it because he wasn't sure about Saul, but Jesus said to him, hey, Ananias, guess what? He's one of you now. He's part of the body of Christ. And I want you to go down there and I want you to prophesy to him and I want you to lay hands on him that he would be healed. And I want you to tell him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake. Well, why didn't Jesus just tell him himself? Because Jesus moves through his body. He moves through his... Could he have told him on the Damascus Road? Of course he could have. And so it says, and we just break into it in Acts 9, verse 17, it says, so Ananias departed. He entered the house. After laying his hands on him, he said these words, Brother Saul... Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like fish scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. And, away, and you know what? We never hear of Ananias again. That was it. We don't know. We, that we, there's no further word about that man. But he went and ministered to Brother Saul. Jesus ministered healing and baptized him in the Holy Spirit and commissioned to him and prophesied to him through his body. And that's the way it works. Well, what's it like to have a body consciousness? How, can Dave, can you help me with this? How, how, can, can we, how do we grow in this area? How do I know how much body consciousness I have? Is there any way of, can you spell this out for me? Well, let me, yeah, I can actually. Let me give you a couple of things. You know, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, and Paul wrote a lot about body consciousness to the church at Corinth because they were lacking in it. And he said this, he said, if one member suffers, 
all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Then he says, so how do I, how do I know? How do I know how body conscious I am? Well, love for the brethren. How much love do you have for your brothers and sisters in Christ? You can tell. John said this. He said, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brother. We love the brother. So how is your love meter this morning? How are we doing? How much do you love the body of Christ? A little bit? A lot? Huge amount? That's how much, that's how body conscious you, you are. Can we grow in our body consciousness? Yes, we can grow in our love. We can grow in our love for the brethren. You see, all who become members of the same spiritual body love one another. It's just, it's there. Because we all have the Holy Spirit. We're all part of this body. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what age we are. It doesn't matter what ethnicity we come from. It doesn't matter what our background is. It doesn't matter uh, of our, our educational level, our talents, our abilities. None of that matters. If you are part of the body of Christ, I love you. You're, you're part of the body of Christ. We're a one body. You're <clears throat> Secondly, another way we can tell how body conscious we are is somebody who is really body conscious hates division. Hates division. <clears throat> division is unnatural to a body. Right? I mean, does your body, if your body attacks itself, you say something wrong with that body. There's something sick about that body. We, we have these diseases now called autoimmune diseases where, where our body attacks itself. Something wrong with that body. That's a disease. That's not natural. I don't go around punching myself in the face with my hand. I don't do that. That would be unnatural. And so a person who has a body consciousness hates division. Anytime you catch yourself being divisive, something rises up within you, say, oh, why did I do that? Why did I say that? I hate that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to criticize my brother or my sister in Christ. I, every time I fall into that trap, something, something, something's wrong. Something inside of me says, there's, there's something wrong about that. Is that true? Do you feel that way? There's an instinctive reaction to it. Why? Because we're, we're all part of the same body. And so division is unnatural. Division is an attack. Thirdly, if I have a strong body consciousness, I'm not individualistic or self-oriented. It's not about me. It's not about my gift. It's not about what grace is upon my life. It's not about me. I, I'm, not in, I, I'm, I'm more interested in you than I am interested in me. I just want you to be well. I want you to prosper. Yes, I'm willing to release the gift and the grace that I have, but it's not about me. It's about, not about my honor or me becoming more famous or anything about that. When there's jealousy and when there's strife and when there's that kind of thing, there's something wrong with that. It, it, it doesn't fit in the body of Christ. It's ridiculous my hand being jealous of my foot because it's not a foot or my eye being jealous of my ear because it's not an ear. <clears throat> Fourth thing is, if I have a body consciousness, I see a need for fellowship. I just want to connect myself with the body of Christ. I want to hang around the church. I want to hang around people. I want to hang around believers. And I'm not talking about just sitting around having a cup of coffee. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But there's more to it than that. I have a hunger to just be here. I have a hunger to, to come here on a Sunday morning and just connect. Just want to be here. I want to be in the presence of my fellow brothers and sisters, the members of the body. I just have a hunger for it. And the stronger that hunger, the more body conscious I am. Fifthly, I want to be a functioning member of the church body. I want, to, I want to be useful. I want to do something. doesn't matter what I do. I just want to serve in some way. I mean, this morning in our announcements, they, we need help. I think I, heard, I think I heard it said that we need 60 or 70 more volunteers. Hey, there's an opportunity 
60 or 70 more volunteers so I could be a part of a celebration that's going to take place at the end of the month, which is a body function. If we are a body conscious church, we'll have no trouble filling those 60 or 70 slots. Right? I get it. I get it. This isn't just a club. This is the church of the living God. And there are many churches in the city of Regina meeting today, and we're all part of the same body. It's just different expressions of the body of Christ meeting this morning in Regina at different places, but we're not separated. We're all part of the same church. You see, and then the last thing is, I see myself under authority. If, I'm, if I have a body consciousness, I see myself under the authority of the head. You know, when Paul came across Christians that did not have a body consciousness, he was shocked. He couldn't believe it. And, and so let me give you an example of it. Uh, the church at Corinth was a, had all kinds of problems. And one of the biggest problems at the church at Corinth is that they, they, were, Greek, they were a Greek-thinking church. They thought, of, they thought of themselves as individuals. They did not understand body, uh, uh, they did not have a strong body consciousness at all. And that's why they had so many difficulties and so many problems. So Paul writes this. 1 Corinthians 3, he says, For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am a Paul, and another, I am a Paulus, are you not mere men? What does he mean, are you not mere men? Are you not just human beings? You're just acting like human beings. Paul, are you actually saying that if we're part of the body of Christ, we're more than human beings? Exactly. That's exactly what he's saying. Listen, church. It's, this is not just an assembly this morning, or if you're watching online, online. This is not just an assembly of human beings here this morning. Because every one of you that's here that knows Jesus has the Holy Spirit in you. And we have of the same, we've all drank of the same spirit. And we are all part of the same body. And when I act, when I act with jealousy or if I, am, if I am strife, I'm walking, I'm acting like a human being, but I'm not acting like a member of the body of Christ. That's why Paul says, are you guys... Are you guys just acting like human beings here? What's wrong with you? That's what he's saying to the church at Corinth. He's shocked. And then he says in, in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, now I'm giving you this, this next instruction. I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it. Paul's saying, I can hardly believe it. I hear there's divisions among you, Corinth, in church. And it's hard for me to believe it. I guess in part, I believe it, but it's staggering me. And then he says, he says, for, uh, there, also, but for there also have to be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you come together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For when you eat, each one takes his own supper first, and one goes hungry while another gets drunk. What? Do you not have a houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What am I to say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night which, when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord but a person must examine himself and so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup for the one who eats and drinks eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not properly recognize the body for this reason, many among you are weak and sick 
and a number are asleep, meaning they died prematurely. Now, I've seen this. I mean, we took communion, I think it was the last week. I've seen people do this. That they're offended at some part of the church. And so they come on a Sunday and it's communion time. Uh-oh. I'm still mad at that guy over there. Still hate him. I'm not taking communion. I don't want to drink judgment to myself. So I'll just let the cup pass me by. And as long as I don't drink that cup and eat that little wafer, I can still be mad at that guy over there. And there's going to be no judgment falling on me. But if I was to eat that wafer and drink that little bit of juice, I could be toast. Have you ever encountered that? I, mean, I know I've known guys that they haven't taken communion for years. They don't dare take communion because if I do, because I hate brother so-and-so over there, I don't want any judgment falling on me. You know what that is? That's religious quackery. That's not what Paul is talking about here. I'll tell you what causes you to be weak and sick and a number to die prematurely is you hate that guy over there. That's what's killing you. Not whether you eat a wafer or not. Are you hearing me? Are people sick because they do not have a body consciousness? Yeah, they are. Now that doesn't mean that everybody is sick. Say, hmm, what kind of sin does that guy got going on in his life? Right? <laughs> That's not what it's about. Well, I want to say this church, we need to examine ourselves and say, you know what? How am I doing with the body of Christ these days? Do I hate anybody in the body of Christ? Am I offending people in the body of Christ? Am I treating people right in the body of Christ? And you know what? If you happen to be married to a Christian, guess what? She or he is not only your, she, your wife or your husband, they are also part of the body of Christ. And if your child is a Christian, they're part of the body of Christ. Think about it. And so on, rather than moving in authority and power and might, Paul's saying if we do not do not discern the body, the opposite happens. We can be weak. We can become ill. And we can even die prematurely. And this is what Paul said. Hey, this is happening to you guys. You know, there's a guy named Ananias and Sapphira. Remember them? Well, Ananias and Sapphira were part of that revival. You know, when, when, when Peter and John were let out of jail and they went to the prayer meeting and the house shook and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit and people started giving everything away, Ananias and Sapphira were there. They were part of that meeting. And there was such a move of the Holy Spirit and such a strong body consciousness that Ananias and Sapphira said, you know, we want to kind of look like we're really connected here. So we have some property and, and there's other people selling their land and laying the proceeds at the feet of the apostles. And man, we don't want to look bad. So let's go sell some of this land. And, you know, we just don't want to give it all. But let's pretend to give it all and we'll give part of it, but we'll pretend we're giving all of it. And so they did that. They had this little plan. They did it. And it said, uh, it says in Acts 5, he kept back for himself part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge, and he brought only a part of it and placed it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, listen what Peter said to him, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds from the sale of the land? Before it was sold, did it not belong to you? And when it was sold, was the money not at your disposal? How have, you, how have you brought up this deed in your heart? How did you come up with this, Ananias? You've not lied to people. You lied to God. <laughs> Do you know what you did? You thought you were lying to Peter. You thought you were lying to the apostles. You actually were lying to God himself because what you do to the member of the body of Christ, you've done to him. Don't you get it, Ananias? He got it, all right. Bam. Bam. And then his wife was next. What was Ananias and Sapphira's problem? They were not body conscious. <laughs> they didn't get it. They didn't have a revelation of the body of Christ. They didn't understand it. I mean, those are severe consequences. But it's in the Bible. It's there. Sometimes when we're lying to people, we think, well, I'm just lying to that person. If that person is a believer, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. Think about that. 
You're lying to the Holy Spirit. Yikes, not a good idea. Well, let me give you a couple of key, my time's almost gone, but let me give you quickly two key aspects of developing a body consciousness. First of all, my relationship to the head, what's my relationship to Jesus? As a part of his body, what is my primary connection to the head? You know what it is? Submission. I submit to the head. Amen? My body, my body, this body for it to work right, needs to submit to the head. If, I'm, if the body of Christ is going to work right, its primary, its primary connection, relationship with Jesus is to submit to him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Jesus is Lord. Amen? I, in other words, I need to hold fast to the head. That's what it means. Holding fast to the head means I submit to the head. Paul said this to the church at Colossae. Take care that no one keeps defrauding you of your prize by delighting in humility and the worship of the angels and taking a stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. What was going on here? The church at Colossae were into this spirit, super spirituality. Oh man, I've seen, a, I have this vision and I've seen these angels and I'm having these spiritual experiences and, and that's what was going on in the church at Colossae. And Paul said, and, and to the church of Colossae, you're inflated in your fleshly mind. I'm not saying there aren't such things as visions or angels. I'm not saying that. But these guys were on a trip. They were, that was their emphasis. And, and not holding firmly to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and the ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. The joints are the relationships, the connections. The head is the central control of the life of the body. John said in, his, in 1 John 5, and the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Listen, the head governs it all. The life that we have in the body comes from the head. There is no life without the head. We, we accept him, but we live in him. And so Jesus is the authority of the body. And when we obey that authority, we have life. We're really alive when we're submitting to the head. Anybody who says he's discerning of the body needs to ask themselves, how subjected are you to the Lord's authority? This proves whether you're discerning the body and you're experiencing the life of the body. How submissive am I to the head? That has an awful lot to do with being body conscious. Jesus said this, follow me. Remember he said that? Follow me. What does that mean? Follow him. <laughs> Simple. Follow him. Wherever he goes, wherever he goes. Wherever he leads you, wherever he leads you. He said, follow me. Jesus is still saying it, church. He's still saying to you and me, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own initiative. Just as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Jesus said, do not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father residing in me performs the miraculous deeds. Peter and John healed the lame at the gate because the Father said, heal that guy. Well, I said, well, why didn't you say it earlier? Because he didn't say it earlier. He said it that day, and they obeyed, and they did it. You see, the body can only follow the head. And so if I wish to discern the body, I need to cover my own head. I need to cover my own head. What do you mean by that? I need to cover my own opinions and my own ideas and my own thoughts and listen to the head. Are you hearing me? That when my opinions and my thoughts contradict his, He's the Lord. He's the head, not me. And when that happens, I, put, I cover my own head. I listen to my, and I submit myself to the head. <clears throat> you see, if I'm not obedient to the head, what I know about the body is simply a doctrinal thing. I think there are people that we, have, we can have theology about the body of Christ. We can talk about it. We can have the right words. We can have the right terminology. But whether we actually understand it and discern it depends and how tightly I am holding on to 
the head, the authority, the true authority that's in my life. And not only is that true of us individually, but that's true of us as a whole corporate church here this morning. How, how strong are we gripped and fastened to the head? And not only that, then there's submission to authority within the body. That gets to be really interesting. Because not only is there authority from the head to the body, but there's authority within the body. For example, my hand is attached to my arm. And if my arm, if my head says to my arm, hey Dave, put your arm behind your back. My head, hand has to go behind my back too. Because it's attached to my arm. If my stomach is hungry, but my mouth refuses to eat. My stomach's in trouble. Amen? So there's an authority within the body that we need to also respond to. If my head says to my hand, you know what, your foot is itchy. Scratch your foot. No, I'm not doing it. Don't want to do it today. Too bad about the foot. My foot's not too happy about that. He wants me to scratch it. Amen? So there's authority within the body. Paul said this to the church at Corinth. He said in 1 Corinthians 16, he says, I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints, that you also be in subjection to such men, and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. You know what? We came in this morning... There are ushers that directed us in here. They have authority. Amen? We need to respond to them. We have people doing all kinds of ministry in this church building right now. And we need to respond to their authority. Amen? We're going to have a global focus celebration here at the end of this month. And there's and Jenny, Jenny Kana and some of our other, and, 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 uh, and other people on our, who are on our team are organizing that ministry and they're uh, and, they, and they have authority to do it, and we need to respond to their authority. When the worship team comes up here to lead us in worship, and they say, stand up, I notice that we stood up. Good. We're responding to their authority. When, they, when Angela said at the end, sit down, we sat down. That's good, actually. She had authority to tell us to sit down. There has to be that kind of authority in the body, or we have chaos, and we can't do anything. One will chase a thousand, but two will chase ten thousand. And look at how, when the enemy wants to attack Jesus, and wants to attack the kingdom, what does he do? He attacks the body. And he brings strife, and he brings division, and he wants us to rip off the authority of our head and have our own authority. And do our own thing. But when I do those things, I am not body conscious. And the second thing is, and I'm going to close with this, I need to hold on to the head. And then I need to connect myself to the body through fellowship. I fellowship the body. My relationship to the head is subjection. My relationship to the body is fellowship. I fellowship the body. Fellowship is critical. Fellowship is me receiving life giving life, receiving life, giving life. It could be through encouragement. It could through, be through prayer. It could be just receiving acts of kindness, doing acts of kindness, seeing needs, meeting needs. It's called fellowship. If I hold fast to the head and I fellowship the body, my consciousness of the body rises and I want to say this to you, church, the stronger our body consciousness is, the more effective the life of Jesus starts flowing through us. And the more that the life of Jesus flows through us, then you start seeing all kinds of things, like the lame man at the gate being healed and people's needs being met and the gospel being preached and people getting saved. I want to say one of the greatest hindrances to the body of Christ today is a lack of discernment of the body of Christ. Let's stand. Does that make sense? <clears throat> it's not your typical Sunday morning message. But you know, I want us to do something this morning. Before you leave, 
I want you to minister. I want us to minister to each other. So if you're here this morning, how many need to be encouraged this morning? How many of you came this morning and you said, I could use, I, I'm just a bit, bit down this morning. See your hand. Stick it up. How many of you came with a need in your body? Stick your hand up. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Keep your hand in the air. I want you to go to somebody who's got their hand in the air. I want you to pray for them before you leave. I'm going to dismiss you. I'm going to pray in prayer right now to dismissal. And then I want you to pray for one another. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning that, Jesus, you are here. You're not here just because we kind of like sense that you're here, but you're here physically because we can see you and touch you because you're here. And I want to thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ that's assembled here this morning. And God, there's authority in this body. And there's anointing in this body. And the Holy Spirit is in this body. And Lord, as we pray for one another this morning, I pray, Lord, that God, that you would minister healing and grace and encouragement to the body here this morning in Jesus' name. And Lord, for those who are watching online, I pray, Lord, you'd minister the grace of God to them and minister to them as well by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we want to thank and praise you for what you're seeing, what we're, what, what you're, what we're seeing here this morning. And Lord, we pray this morning as we go that, God, you'd minister grace to your body right now. Lord, would you heal, do healing in your body this morning right here before we leave. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Pray. Amen. Now I want you to minister to one another. However you feel God wants you to minister, I want you to go to somebody if you feel comfortable doing that. If you don't, that's fine. But if you feel comfortable doing that, go to somebody, minister to them. Pray for them. I don't think there's anybody in this building that couldn't receive some prayer, couldn't use prayer. And you're free to go when you wish.